page 35 of your books, where we're starting on state space control. And as I mentioned before we broke, uh, the afternoon sessions will apply the theory from this morning to actually implement control. The first time in a seminar called State Space Control that we've ever actually done any control. So it's a bit disappointing that it's taken this long. We're going to uh, begin by examining the concept of state feedback. That is uh, feedback control where the state vector is used in a negative feedback loop rather than the output being used. Uh, there are some very compelling reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, among them, the degrees of flexibility that the designer has to achieve the performance that he or she wants is far greater if you use state feedback than it is with output feedback control. Um, uh, and uh, there are a few methods of implementing state feedback control, a few methods of designing state feedback control systems. If your system has one input, then uh, there are a couple of relatively simple methods that can be, can be um, employed um, to place the poles in the desired regions of the complex plane. <clears throat> but uh, if your system has more than one input, then you quickly find that you have uh, choices to make because the feedback matrix, which is used in the state feedback loop, um, you, can you can actually find several different uh, feedback matrices that give you the right eigenvalues. And so you have to make choices about which feedback gains you use. And they're not all the same. Some of them will give you slightly better performance than others because although the eigenvalues are right, the actual eigenvectors, the total eigenvectors will be different. Uh, so the method that I'm going to use for uh, feedback control design in the multiple input case is called eigenstructure assignment. Um, it's at the first sight a relatively complex process. But once you get your head around what's going on, it's pretty simple because you're just following a set of steps. And there isn't much to go wrong. But you do have choices to make along the way. And that, that's really where the eigen assignment, eigenstructure assignment method um, is something we need to spend a little bit of time on. So after we've done that, we'll have completed the first part of this exercise, which is designing for transient response. Because we've placed the poles of closed loop in the desired locations. Then we have to focus on the steady state performance. This is typically the way you do it. You design the feedback gain matrix to give you the good, good, steady, good transient performance, and then you focus on an input matrix to give you uh, the steady state performance that you need. Now, yesterday, uh, we saw when we discussed different type numbers of systems, and we compared type numbers with the form of the input stimulus. And we said, OK, for a step input, we must have at least one integrator around the, around the loop. We established that integral, integral control gives you zero steady state error. And the same is true for state space control as well. You can employ integral control to remove steady state error. The problem is that in so doing, you increase the order of the closed loop system, because every integrator adds another state to the state vector. And so the design techniques have to account for that. And uh, there's, a, a, a fairly important, there's a process that you have to follow to make sure that those states and the eigenvalues that they contribute are where you want them to be. Um, so it's similar in general concept to output feedback control, but the detail is very different and uh, quite a lot more complicated. So this is what you're actually going to end up doing when you design a state feedback control system. Uh, we've described this morning the uh, space-based system defined by four matrices, A, B, C, and D. Uh, with an input vector u, an output vector y, and an internal state vector x. The state feedback loop uh, goes through a matrix called k. That's the symbol I'm going to use, and it's mostly used, uh, which consists of uh, an array of fixed gains, at least it, it does in, in, this, in this case. And uh, it contributes an r by 1 output uh, vector. So there's an n by 1 vector coming in, that's a state vector, and an r by 1 vector going out, which is added to another r by 1 vector to produce the r by 1 input, uh, which is the control to the system. The state feedback gain matrix is the one that fixes the transient response of the system. And we usually design that first. Once we have that, we can then turn our attention to an input matrix, which I'm going to call n. And it's the input matrix that allows us to adjust the steady state, system, uh, steady state properties of the system, or at least to have an input which can control the steady state output. So you've got two separate matrices, k and n, and respectively they control the transient performance and the steady state performance. Uh, 
So state feedback, why you would use this, it, 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 it achieves superior performance compared with output feedback. And the reason is that all of the dynamic information of the system is captured in X of T, whereas if you control just using the output, well, there may be information that's not present in the output that is present in the state vector. So you get better performance through doing this. And uh, the problem with using the state vector, of course, is that you're using a set of elements which are internal to the system description, meaning that they may or may not appear at the output, and usually they don't. And furthermore, you may have chosen things that you can't directly measure. So we have somehow to get hold of the state vector before we can apply state feedback control. And uh, that's the job of part two of this design, which is in, part, in chapter eight, uh, the design of an algorithm called an estimator or an observer. Those two words mean the same thing, uh, which uh, delivers the state vector uh, given uh, an input uh, U of T. It's based on, well, there are various ways of doing it, but we're going to use a linear state estimator, which contains a model of the plant. So uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to firstly focus on the design of the feedback gain matrix K. And <coughs> if there are single input, uh, if we're dealing with a single input system, U of T is a scalar, it's not a vector at all. And we can place the closed loop poles by a couple of different techniques. We can do it manually. There's a simple algebraic method of doing it that I'm going to tell you, uh, walk you through. Uh, and there is also a formula called Ackerman's formula, which automates part of that. That's useful. Uh, if you're dealing with a high order system and the manual process gets a little bit tedious. Um, generally, those methods are called pole placement methods. And in the multiple input case, as I've told you, we're going to use uh, eigenstructure assignment um, to do that. And uh, then once we've designed the K matrix, we're going to focus on the design of the uh, input matrix N to meet steady state design specifications. So this then is the uh, the structure of the state feedback control system with the input matrix N present. And uh, the green blocks in here comprise the model of the plant, the ABCD model of the plant. Nothing's changed from the diagram at the start of chapter five. The two additional matrices that we, we've added are the R by N matrix K, which contains the feedback gains, and the R by P matrix N, which contains the input gains. Um, and therefore, V, which is our new input to the system, uh, has a dimension p. p is the integer that fixes the number of inputs to the system, which may or may not be the same as r. In the general case, it may not. Now, what's called the control law uh, for a system, as you saw yesterday in the discrete time case, is the formula which generates the control effort, u of t. And you can see by inspection what the control law is. It's going to be n times v minus k times x. So this formula at the bottom of the screen is the control law. And the system and the output equations haven't changed from before. It's the same system. So now we have three equations which uh, define the operation of the state feedback control system. And we can insert the third equation into the first two uh, to give us the closed loop uh, equations. And uh, here they are, state feedback equations. Here's the state equation with the control law inserted into it. And you see now there are two terms involving x. There's A and there's minus B times K. The order is important. A minus BK is an N by N matrix. And now the uh, input matrix is B times N. So if you like, this is the state equation of the whole thing. On the previous slide, if you just treated this whole thing as a black box from here all the way around that, so that the original plant model plus K and N are part of your system now, this is the closed loop state equation, including K and N. And if we insert the um, controller into the output equation, we have Cx plus D times NV minus Kx. So you have a similar change to the output matrix, which becomes C minus DK. It's still an uh, M by N matrix. So the N by N matrix, I'm sorry. Uh, it's M by N. And you, still ha and you have D times N times V. Now, the important thing is that when you look at the new state and output matrices, the equivalent system matrix, input matrix, output and transmission matrices are different. And remember, when we defined the properties of controllability and observability, they depended on the matrices A, B, and C. A and B for the controllability property, well, those have both changed. And A and C for the observability property, and those have both changed. 
So just the fact that you've got a plant which is both controllable and observable doesn't mean that when you apply state feedback that the whole thing is going to be controllable and observable. And that might matter if you're going to have this as a subsystem in a larger system later on. So when we examine controllability, for example, this is the controllability matrix P of the basic plant with A and B matrices. And when we substitute for A minus BK as the new system matrix and BN as the new input matrix, well, you're just going to insert those into the same formula for the controllability matrix and work it out. Under state feedback, it's quite possible that this matrix might lose rank and that therefore you may lose controllability. But usually, usually you don't. And in fact, providing the rank of your input matrix N is equal to R, it has full rank. In other words, you don't lose it. That's what it turns out. Uh, but this is how to calculate it if you ever need to. And similarly with observability, um, well, there are different C and A matrices now, so they just get applied uh, in place of C and A in the previous formula. You can lose observability because if C equals B times K, then the new C matrix, new output matrix is zero, and uh, therefore you can end up with losing observability, obviously, because if the output matrix is zero, then there is nothing passing through to the output, so it's possible. Now, in discrete time, nothing else is different apart from the usual notational differences and the replacement of the integrators by the delay elements. Uh, everything else is exactly the same. The application of the control law um, is, is exactly the same. Now, what I'm going to do now is to go to the double math system I described at the end of chapter six. Uh, and for a given value of k, so a given selection of feedback gain elements, show you the difference that state feedback can make to the performance of that system. Uh, remember that that double math system was oscillatory, to say the least, and uh, I think you're going to be surprised by how much difference is made by the application of state feedback. So let's go ahead and um, create this model in MATLAB. And uh, the state feedback gain that I'm going to use is this one. This is the state feedback matrix. It's a one by four matrix because the system is fourth order and the input is just the uh, force which is applied to the mass, M1. Um, so it's a one input for fourth order system. And so what we're doing here is, uh, we're first of all, com for comparison purposes, going to repeat the initial condition test that was done in uh, tutorial 6.4. And uh, what that does for us is confirm that we do indeed have a very oscillatory response. And then the next step of this is to discretize it because the tutorial says that uh, we're looking for a discrete time controller, discretizing the plant with a sample period of 0 0.2. Uh, and uh, then what we're going to do is to use what must be a discrete time feedback. So let's discretize the plant. There we go. So we've got the discrete time matrices. And now what I'm going to do is simulate this. But to simulate it, I'm going to do that in MATLAB. Uh, sorry, in Simulink. So there is a, a Simulink model already prepared for this, which has the same structure that I showed you before. It's the uh, ABCD model of the uh, double mass system, and then the feedback gain matrix comes from X and goes into uh, to U. And in this example, I'm assuming that there is no uh, adjustment necessary for the um, for the input matrix. I'm not focusing on steady state yet. I'm just giving this, uh, never mind the steady state. Let's look at the transient properties to begin with. And so when I run this, after all the matrices have been initialized, you can see that the vector quantities appear as bold lines. And uh, inside the workspace, we've got things like uh, the output and the states appearing. So we can use those in the MATLAB script. So down here, we'll construct uh, the output of the system under state feedback control. And I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty impressive because uh, we've gone from this, I wish I could get rid of that slidey thing. We've gone from this to this, and that, that's pretty good. This is a system which is uncontrollable. Uncontrolled, I mean, it, it's just left to its own devices, and its oscillation goes on for hundreds of seconds. And yet here, we've got a controller which, uh, let's assume that the steady state is taken care of, it doesn't matter for now, but um, it converges on the steady state within, uh, let's say, 10 seconds or so, and the response is nicely exponential. So you might expect that we've chosen real eigenvalues for this, and in fact, 
that's exactly what's happened. There are four real eigenvalues. But what a difference, eh, with state feedback control. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, we can also plot, plot the states uh, of this, but I, I don't think that at this stage it's terribly uh, helpful <coughs> beyond saying that this red line here, uh, which is X3, is the position of the second mass, which we've influenced only by moving the first mass and all that coupling in between. All those oscillatory effects have been undone by the application of feedback control. Uh, now, before we go ahead and do the design, I just want to spend a couple of minutes refreshing our memories on the contents of the third chapter yesterday, where I explained the relationship between uh, complex poles and transient response. Recall that for the second order case, the uh, characteristic equation contained two variables, beta and omega n, and that the poles uh, will be expressed in terms of those variables. Um, so for the complex conjugate case, uh, a pole would be at minus sigma plus or minus j omega d. Sigma was equal to the product of zeta and omega n, so that gave us the real component of the pole. And the imaginary component was given by omega d, which was uh, omega n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Recall that these were in, appeared in the step response equation uh, in the following way. Sigma determined the rate of decay of the response, and omega d determined the oscillation frequency. And uh, the other terms that you might have come across were omega n and zeta, which were the basic parameters in the original equation. Omega n <coughs> fixed the radius of the vector, the, the length of the vector from the origin out to the pole, whereas zeta fixed the angle that that vector makes with a negative real axis through an arc cosine. And I remind you, uh, though I think this made perhaps a bigger impression yesterday, the graph, the, the diagram here shows the effect of moving poles or complex poles around in the, uh, in the complex plane. And in general, as we move the poles further to the left, the rate of decay got faster because sigma was becoming more, more negative. And as we moved the poles up, uh, the imaginary uh, gave it a more bigger imaginary component where the frequency of oscillation got larger because omega d was getting larger. And you can see both of these things in the, um, in the complex plane. So discrete time systems, very much the same is true, except that uh, the rate of decay was related to the proximity of the pole to the origin of the unit circle, and that the frequency of oscillation is related to the angle that we went around the unit circle. So as we move further and further around the unit circle, um, the oscillation frequency increased. And so in general, then, what are we looking for? Well. <coughs> So if we want a faster decay, we move poles to the left. If we want more or less oscillation, we move the poles up and down the, um, the, the, uh, the imaginary axis or give them a greater or larger imaginary component. And the corresponding movement in the Z plane is um, to move them towards the origin if we want a faster decay and to move them around the unit circle if we want higher oscillation or lower oscillation. Now, in the root locus design, we use this information to select poles in the complex plane that we hoped would give us a satisfactory transient response. And if we had a second order system, we could be very exact about that. Because we only had two poles, so we knew exactly what we were going to get. But in general, your system has many more than two poles. You might have five, ten, or a hundred poles in there. And so what do you do? Because the actual transient response you get is the combination of all of them. All the poles contribute to the overall response. Now, you can't really do much about the root loci because whatever you do, you're going to move the poles along the root loci in the methods that we used yesterday. But with state feedback control, you can put the poles anywhere you like in the complex plane. So you have a bit more freedom to separate them and put dominant poles where you want and ones that perhaps you're not so interested in, move them further away. So one design technique, which is pretty solid, is to select for yourself a pair of dominant second order poles and use those to mimic the response of a second order system with, pro with the properties that you want. So for example, if you're aiming for a transient response with such and such an overshoot and such and such a settling time, identify regions in the complex plane where you'd like your poles to be based on a second order system, put those poles there, and aim to design the other closed loop poles much further to the left 
so that they don't influence significantly the uh, transient response. So you kind of base it around a second order res response. Now, uh, before we go any further, um, your basic system, ABCD, has a set of poles, right? a set of eigenvalues which will appear somewhere in the complex plane. And what we're going to do now will allow us to reposition those poles using feedback so that they're in the places we want them to be. Now, the further that you move those poles, the bigger will be the gains in the feedback gain matrix K. Right? The bigger will be the gains in the feedback matrix K. It means that, uh, same for discrete time systems, so let's use that. If I have a set of basic poles, basic eigenvalues defined by the ABCD matrix, or the phi gamma CD matrix in the discrete time system, and I want to move those poles a long way, I'm going to end up with big gain elements in K, and therefore there are going to be big terms coming in through U. Uh, it's understandable, isn't it? You've got a lot of work to do if you want to change the performance of the system significantly. And it may well be that U of K may exceed some allowable limit. So, yes, you've got the ability to do whatever you want, but there is still a price to be paid. That price is that large gain elements may introduce, well, they introduce large gains, so you've got large signals coming out, and you've also got the potential to amplify noise in the physical system as well. So, in theory, it's, it's possible, but there are practical considerations to be taken into account as well. So, the guidelines are place your poles far into the left in the S plane because that makes them farther. Uh, makes them faster, uh, but be careful because the wide bandwidth that you induce through that may also end up amplifying noise in the system. Um, increase in bandwidth uh, can result in an increase in disturbances and noise. And remember, as I said, that shifting the eigenvalues a significant distance through the use of state feedback results in large elements in the feedback gain matrix, which carries itself possible difficulties in terms of the size of the U vector over time. Um, which may mean that the control magnitude is bigger, so maybe you need a bigger actuator, there's cost, maybe the saturating things. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong. And uh, sometimes this is where modal analysis can help because uh, the system has to work harder for weak modes, weakly controllable modes, particularly if uh, one or more of the beta I transpose uh, vectors contain small elements. It means that whatever you're trying to do to that mode is hard to do. You need um, you need a lot of effort, and what, what you can get from a modal decomposition is look at the range of the beta I transpose elements of the, the vectors. If you're seeing some very big numbers in some of the beta I vectors and very small numbers in some of the others, that can be an indication that you're going to have to work harder for some of the nodes. So here's the first design technique. It's called pole placement, and uh, in principle, it's very similar, simple. Um, it only works for systems that have a single input. So in this case, we've got a K matrix, which is a row matrix, because its output is a scalar quantity. It's a thin line that's going directly into the B matrix here. Um, and so the B matrix is going to be uh, an N by 1 matrix. Uh, and then the rest of the system, you remember. Now, I'm assuming that we've come to this visualization through a transfer function representation, in which case the D matrix is zero, and we've just got ABC in this case. Uh, the eigenvalues of the system under closed loop control, remember we had lambda I minus A before, and the control law now means that the A matrix has changed from A to A minus BK, so the closed loop eigenvalues are at lambda I minus A plus BK. We work out the determinant of that. That tells us where the closed loop eigenvalues are. And so really, it's an exercise in finding what value of k delivers the right eigenvalues. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. That will allow us to position the eigenvalues in the right place. Now, there's a simple manual way of going about it, just with algebra. And if I had a whiteboard and some time, I'd do it, because there's a tutorial that does that. Or there's an automated technique, which involves using a formula called Ackermann's formula that takes the hard work out of it, or there's a script in MATLAB called PLACE. Guess which one we're going to use. <laughs> so here's the eigenvalue placement theorem. Remember, it applies to single value, um, single input systems. And it's sometimes called the pole shifting theorem or spectrum assignment. Um, so what you have to do, first of all, is to decide on a set of eigenvalues that you'd like to have. Obviously, there'll be n of them. 
And uh, you can achieve any eigenvalues you like through a, a constant feedback gain matrix, and here's how you go about it. You select a set of eigenvalues, and therefore, you've got uh, the characteristic equation immediately. Right? You, you've got this uh, equation, the characteristic equation in factor form that you can expand out, and that reveals these coefficients, c0 to c sub n minus 1. Now, c sub n will always be 1 because this is in factored form, and it's assuming that you've got no other gains present. So this is a monic polynomial. A sub n is 1. And there exists a real gain matrix somewhere which will produce that for you. So k exists, and it exists such that delta sub d of lambda has it, is, its, is the characteristic polynomial of that equation. Uh, the higher eigenvalues, yeah, this is the other thing. Remember yesterday when I talked about uh, differential equations and then transfer functions, I told you that in the differential equation, all the coefficients must be real. And the consequence of that was that when you found the roots of the polynomial, right, the characteristic equation roots, the poles of the system, they were always either real or complex conjugates. Now, we're going the other way here. It means that you really want to end up with a gain matrix that has only real numbers in it. You don't want complex numbers in there, otherwise how are you going to implement them? So in other words, you've got to choose a set of poles or eigenvalues which are either real or they're complex conjugates. And once you've done that, then you guarantee that the elements of K will be, uh, will be real. You can't choose a complex eigenvalue without also having a conjugate eigenvalue, an equivalent conjugate eigenvalue. That will assume that that will ensure that all these lambdas are real and therefore all these coefficients are real as well. Now, the manual technique relies on transforming the system into controllable canonical form. It's really neat the way this works because once you can do that, everything else becomes very simple. Remember, every transfer function representation has an equivalent controllable canonical form. Remember also the structure of the system matrix. It was all zeros except for the superdiagonal. And all the coefficients of the denominator, which define the eigenvalues, appear in the bottom row. That's the clue to being able to use this. So when you form the matrix lambda i minus a plus b k and work out its determinant, this is what you're working out. Now, if you look at the structure of this, lambda i is an identity matrix, but it's multiplied by lambda. So all the elements on the diagonal are lambda. And those elements appear down here now in the uh, in the diagonal of this matrix, minus a plus bk. Well, you know what a is. So the minus a puts these minus ones down here. And b times k, well, b is really simple because it's only got a 1 in the last element down there. So when you multiply that by k, right, you end up with the bottom row of this containing all the terms in the k matrix and everything else being 0. So think about this. b is going to be an n by 1 matrix and k is a 1 by n matrix. So n by 1 times 1 by n, you get an n by n matrix out of that. But it's all zeros apart from this last row, which is where the k elements appear. So all the information that we're interested in appears in the bottom row of this matrix. And that's because we started with a controllable canonical form representation. So here's where the actual eigenvalues of this matrix are. You work out this polynomial at the bottom and solve it for lambda. There's the actual uh, eigenvalues. You with me? So in the previous slide, what I showed you was the eigenvalues you want have this polynomial. Um, and the eigenvalues you actually got, where the gains of the feedback matrix in them, are the solutions to this polynomial. Right? So now all you've got to do is equate coefficients. It's relatively simple. That's what you've got. And that's what you want. And so you can look, for example, at c sub n minus 1 and say, well, I'd like that to be the same as k sub n plus a sub n minus 1. And that's really all there is to it. Because you know a and you know c. The only thing you don't know is k sub n. And then it's really a matter of doing it term by term. So the formula is c equals k uh, sub I, it's k, c sub i equals k sub i plus 1 plus a sub i. Well, you're interested in k sub i plus 1, so let's just you know, take k sub i and move the other indices along. It's the difference between c sub i minus 1 and a sub i minus 1. And you do that for each of those coefficients in those two polynomials. And at the end of it, you work out, um, you just factorize and work out where the, oh, sorry, you don't need to factorize. Those are the, the gains you've got immediately for the feedback gain matrix. So it kind of looks trivial, isn't it? 
Now, uh, there is a tutorial on this, but unfortunately it involves use of the whiteboard, so I'm going to skip over this one and go to the Ackermann's formula in the next thing. There is, it's written up in the book if you get hold of it, um, but it really isn't, isn't terribly difficult to do. And all I'm doing is reinforcing what I think is a fairly self-evident concept here. So I'm going to jump over tutorial 7.2 and go to the automated technique for doing this, which is called Ackermann's formula. Ackermann's formula uh, relies on a couple of things. Uh, this, this is Ackermann's formula near the bottom. Uh, it produces for you the K matrix directly, and it equals this. There's a, a, a row matrix, which is n elements long, terminating in one. So it's like a transpose B matrix. And then it takes the controllability matrix and inverts it and multiplies it by delta sub D of A. So let me explain what these terms are. The controllability matrix you already know. That's what I've told you about in section 6. The delta sub D uh, polynomial, you also know that because that's the expanded desired set of polynomials. Let me go back to the previous slide and uh, show you where that was. It's this one, right? You, you, your desired polynomial equation is that one. And Ackermann's formula contains that desired polynomial equation, but instead of having lambda as the parameter, it has A as the parameter. So you just simply replace lambda with A, and that's the third term in Ackermann's formula down there. And the result is, in this case, a 1 by n matrix containing all the elements of the feedback gain uh, matrix. That's, that's the gain matrix that comes out directly. So I'm quickly going to illustrate it in uh, 7.3. Now, we can apply this to that double mass system because that system is a single input system. And uh, I'm going to apply it and then uh, evaluate its response for the same initial condition that I showed you about I showed you in uh, tutorial 6.4. I've uh, just forgotten which tutorial, 7.3. Okay, nothing surprising in the first cell. We're just creating a model of the system. And now here's the work. All the work's been done in the second cell. We are this, this uh, specifying a desired set of eigenvalues, and it's a discrete time implementation that we're going for. So we've chosen eigenvalues that are real and uh, less than one and positive. So they lie on the positive real axis. We should expect each of these to contribute an exponential term because that's what poles on the positive real axis between 0 and 1 do. And then we use this command, place. Place will implement Ackermann's formula for, it, for us. You need to give it C gamma and an array which contains your desired eigenvalues and it will deliver the feedback gain matrix K. That does all the work for us. So let's do that. And uh, those of you who remember tutorial 6.4 might also remember that these numbers were the ones in the feedback gain matrix that we used then. And you saw the difference that they made to the transient response. Well, this is where they came from. It was simply Ackerman's formula. Now we'll construct the closed loop system, which is a state space system, and you know now that the, the system matrix is phi minus gamma k or a minus b times k. And uh, right now we're not changing uh, gamma because the, there is no input matrix. So let's just complete the closed loop state equations. And what we'll do now is check that the eigenvalues are indeed where we want them to be. We'll form phi minus gamma k and check where the eigenvalues are, and hopefully they're at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.9. So it looks as if the technique is working. And now we'll plot the initial condition, open loop response, which is the oscillatory one, but for a very restricted interval between 0 and 15 seconds. Remember, this oscillation goes on for hundreds of seconds, so I'm just looking at the first couple of cycles of oscillation in the initial condition response. And then what we'll do is overlay on it the uh, corrected response which you can see is quite a lot different. And uh, that's an amazing difference uh, that this feedback control has made. The control effort is like that. See, the control effort really only takes its effect in the first few seconds of this. Because if you just imagine just sort of you know, pulling these apart or compressing them together and then letting them go and letting them do their own thing, that's fine. But to, to stop these oscillations from happening, the control action that you need to apply as a force to the right-hand side, the left-hand side of mass M1, that's really only present in the first cycle or so to stop the other cycles from building up. 
future. You can kind of see that that's what happened. But this is the control effort in the right. Really, beyond three seconds or so, you're not doing anything because all the work's already been done by that stage. Um, now, some of these gain elements are pretty big. Uh, uh, you've got, oh, actually, they're not too bad. The smallest one is six and a half. The biggest one is 19, 20. That's not too bad. If you did have big gain elements in there, uh, one of the exercises that you should go through is to check the magnitude of the control effort to assure that it wasn't, it wasn't excessive in some regard. OK, so far, so good. We now know how to design feedback uh, gain matrices for single input systems. Uh, now it's going to get more complicated. Uh, so where you've, got, where you've got multiple inputs or when you can't get the system into controllable canonical form, Neither the manual pole placement method nor Ackerman's method can be used. You need something that's a bit more complicated. Uh, and I'm going to show you a, a method called structure, eigenstructure assignment next. Um, you'll be called on along the way to make some choices because, as I said, there is more than one solution to the feedback gain problem now. Uh, prudent selection of the gains you use, which really boils down to prudent selections of the eigenstructures, which I'll define what they are in a moment, make a very big difference to performance. And I'm going to illustrate this by designing a system with a set of eigenstructures, a good choice, and running its performance, and then doing the same thing for a poor choice. And you'll be quite surprised what a difference that can make to the performance. So we're going to use eigenstructure assignment next. Now, here's the theory behind the eigenstructure assignment case. The closed loop eigenvalues are the solutions to this determinant, lambda i minus a plus b k. And uh, if this is true, then you must have at least one vector which falls into the null space of that. Because remember how we defined eigenvectors and eigenvalues before. We defined the eigenvalue first, which was lambda i minus a. And if you had one, then you had an eigenvector there too. So you did uh, lambda i minus a and looked for a non-trivial solution to it. Uh, and, and in this case, you must have an eigenvector that's associated with this eigenvalue. Now, you could write it this way. Or what you could do is separate these terms out so that you've got lambda i minus a times this, this vector phi to phi sub i plus b k times phi sub i equals zero. It's the same thing. And you could write that then in a partition matrix form, which looks like this. So that is the same as that is the same as that. There are three things. We all agreed on that. Now, this vector on the right, because it is a vector, is called an eigenstructure. And it contains phi sub i, the solution to that, so that's the eigenvector to the closed loop equation in the upper partition, and k times that vector in the lower partition. Right? It's an eigenstructure. I don't know how many columns or rows it's got. I don't know how many rows it's got, but how many columns depends on how many inputs. Now, for each eigenvector, you get r independent solution vectors. This is C, I think that is C, that one, like taxi, that's the Greek letter C, uh, which is one of these eigenstructures and written transpose, it looks, it looks like that. So for every input, you, for every lambda i, you're going to get as many of these eigenstructures as you've got inputs, right? So it's quite a lot of them, potentially. And what you do is you collect them all together in a giant matrix and select vectors from them. Let me show you the process. Uh, the first step is you determine all of these eigenstructure vectors. You're going to get r of them for each lambda i, where r is the number of inputs. So you've already got potentially quite a lot of these vectors. And then you collect them all together for each lambda i in a great big matrix like this. Right? So for a system that has, say, 10 inputs, each lambda i is going to give you a matrix with 10 partitions in it. Each lambda i. And you've got n lambda i's. Right? So that's one choice of eigen va eigenvalue is going to give you these R eigenstructures, and they're all collected together in this matrix over here on the right. Remember, you've got another, however many of those, you've got N of those. So what you do is you collect all of them, but all the lambdas, and you put them in an even bigger partition matrix, U of lambda 1, U of lambda 2, all the way up to U of lambda N. Okay? It's a giant matrix at this point. But look at the structure of it, right? The structure looks like this. You've got these upper rows here, I think n rows of this, containing these vectors, c, 
which came from the collection of all these CI vectors over here. And then the lower partition is, well, it's the same vector, but there's a common term in K that will factor out. So what we do is we exploit this relationship between the upper partitions and the lower partitions to find K for this, this system. Because you could rewrite the lower partition this way, K factors out. Now, the way that you do this is, is this. You look at the lower partition and factor out K. And then what you do is for each eigenvalue on the left, you, you select one column, right? So from this matrix here, which it contains our separate eigenstructures, you select one of them, it's one column. And you go over the right and you look at the first partition there and you select the same column. One column from that one, one column from that one, but the same, the same column. If it's the third column from the left here, it must be the third column from the left in that one. And you do that for each of these partitions in this, this matrix and each of these partitions in this matrix here. And I'm going to call those matrices G and F. And they have dimensions N by N and R by N. Now, K is unknown at this point, except that you know its size. It's an R by N matrix. But we want to know what it is. So what we do is we invert this and post multiply both sides by it. So now K is F times G to the minus 1. And if you've done your job well, and you've chosen column, columns from each of these matrices to construct G that are as orthogonal as possible, it'll be possible to invert this. It'll have good orthogonal, orthogonal, orthogonality and invertibility properties. And furthermore, the design will be as good as possible. So the choices that you make are the columns from each of these partitions and you try to make them as orthogonal as possible. That's how you do eigenstructure assignments. That'll give you K. Now, I realize that there's a lot of detail in there, even though there's only five steps, right? And the reason it looks complicated, it's the first time you've seen it. Once you've seen it three times, it'll lose a lot of its mystique. And once you've seen it 10 times, you'll, think, you'll wonder what all the fuss was about. Uh, At this point, I think I'd like to do a demonstration on it. So I want to go quickly over the eigenstructure assignment. Choose the columns to be as orthogonal as possible. There are many reasons for it, but basically you're going to get better performance uh, from that. Now, in order to work out which of those columns are orthogonal, you have, first of all, to normalize them. Because you, you can't evaluate them until you do. So you normalize the elements of each of the eigenstructures by dividing by their uh, they're, they're two norms, so that you have normalized to length of one. And then what you do is you carry out a dot product on them, the inner product, as it's called. So all of your choices, you form inner products from all of the columns, and you try to minimize the dot product sum as you go through. You'll see that in just a second. You select the minimum one. Now, I can't apply this to the um, double math system because that only had one input. And the eigenstructure assignment method works with systems with multiple inputs. So I want a nice, complicated system uh, to work with, and what better than an airplane? Uh, this is not the most glamorous airplane in the world, but it does at least illustrate uh, how models of flight dynamics are constructed. Um, they're intrinsically of eighth order. Um, um, but the equations are usually divided into two separate fourth order sets, one of which determines the longitudinal motion and the other of which gives us the lateral dynamics. The lateral dynamics of the aircraft motion are its side slip, its roll rate, and its yaw rate. They're the things that happen as going from side to side. Okay. So to summarize this then, you've got these U, V, and W axes, which are the up, down, forward, and back, and left, and right coordinates. But you've also got these rotational axes, V, W, and U, which are the <coughs> V is side slip, W is altitude rate, and U is forward rate. These are rates. Now, we're going to concentrate on designing a lateral, fe lateral dynamics feedback control system using a digital controller for this type of system. And we need to know V, P, R, and one other thing, which is the roll angle. So roll rate is the derivative of roll angle. That's how the models are constructed. Now, the inputs to the system, almost forgot, uh, there's two things, rudder angle and aileron angle. And you can see, I think, both of those would influence the machine in its, you know, its left-right flight path. Okay. 
So the inputs are rudder and aileron angle, and the states are P, R, and V, and T, which is uh, the integral of P. And therefore, since you've got two inputs and four states, you know already the dimensions of the feedback matrix, which is going to be two by four. Now, the uh, aircraft I'm going to use to describe this was um, first uh, developed in the 1960s as the first supersonic jet fighter. Uh, it was called the Crusader aircraft. It was made by a company called Vought. And uh, the reason I want to choose it is that in 1972, NASA got hold of one, and they installed the automatic gain control computer that I described in yesterday's seminar, the one that controlled the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, that was bolted into it and used as the test bed for the first fly-by-wire system in an aircraft. And fly-by-wire means that we do away with mechanical linkages like, you know, wires and levers and things like that. The only linkage that exists between the pilot and the flight surface is an electronic one. And there's a digital controller in there. Now, uh, <clears throat> this type of aircraft uh, must have been one of the most dangerous aircraft there ever was to fly. It was... Um, it suffered from a very pronounced low-speed yaw instability, which meant that as you were coming in to land the darn thing on an aircraft carrier, it would have the habit of pointing its nose in different directions as you were coming in, and you took pot luck when you happened to hit the deck that you was pointing in the right direction. Um, it also, uh, on, its, on, its, on the other hand, it was extremely powerful. It was a fighter aircraft that was meant to fly faster than the speed of sound, so its power-to-weight ratio was incredible. Um, it was built to land on an aircraft carrier, and it had those wings that you sometimes see, and they fold up like that, right? So you can pack as many as you can on a small aircraft carrier deck or even on a big aircraft carrier deck. And there were several recorded instances of people forgetting to fold the wings down before they took off, right? But this thing was so powerful, it would take off and fly around and still land relatively safely, and then the pilot would get out and complain that his plane was handling a little bit sluggishly that day, right? It had enough power to do that. Uh, there are lots of other stories. The, the, the fatality rate was almost one per aircraft. And, and it, it wasn't that they were crashing so much. It was that when they wheeled the thing around the deck of the aircraft carrier, the air intake was right underneath the cockpit like that. And it would suck people into the front. They used to call it the gator. It's called the alligator. And it really was an awful aircraft anyway. Um, it did uh, fly, and it did serve as the test bed for the first um, fly-by-wire aircraft system. And I'm going to show you how that would be designed to control the lateral flight dynamics uh, for this F-8C, right, the C being the one that was given to NASA for all this work. Now, these are the flight dynamics. Now, it's very nonlinear, so you take a particular operating point, a particular set of flight conditions, and linearize to it. And this is what the lateral flight dynamic matrices look like. The A and the B matrix look like this. And here's the state vector, and here's what the input controls are, the aileron and rudder angle. Yes. Oh, here we go. Uh, it, I would suggest that there's quite a lot of empirical work going on here. I don't think people sat down and modeled this aircraft. I think they measured a lot of this. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how these numbers were arrived at. I've only got the data to work with, but I would suspect this was not purely theoretical. Um, yeah. It is, yes. Yeah. That, that's what the control engineers always say, isn't it? You give them a problem and they say, we'll give you the model. You know, we're getting hold of the model is half the problem, you know, most of the time. But anyway, we've got the model to work with because it's, it's a control seminar and I've got the tutorials so we've got the model. Uh, let's do the tutorial then. So here we go. So I'm beginning. Begin. Now, the, the actual description of this problem exists actually in more than one textbook. One of them is Brogan, uh, and it is, an, it is a problem in, in the Brogan textbook, if you want. And I'll recommend Brogan at the end. I'll show you where you, you get that. But um, I didn't just invent it. It's, it's a real set of data, um, which will, first of all, model those matrices. And now the very first step that we should do before we design any controller for any system is check that it's actually possible to control that system. You don't have to do it, but if it isn't possible, you've wasted your time later on. So we'll run a controllability check standard from now on. Check the size of the system. In this case, it's a fourth order problem. 
check the controllability matrix has rank N, in this case rank of four, and happily the system is controllable and we may proceed. Now, it's a discrete time controller that we want to implement, that's in problem statement, of five hertz, a very fast sample rate. So the first thing we're going to do is discretize the system matrices. There they are. So we've done that work for a five hertz sample rate. And now we have to specify some eigenvalues. Now, they were given in the problem, but they were uh, continuous time eigenvalues. And we need to convert them into this equivalent discrete time. So we use e to the s times t. S, uh, t is 0 0.2. And, uh, well, it's e to the lambda t. So this is, this is what we're going to end up with as discrete time, discrete time eigenvalues. Are you OK with that? e to the st, you just plug t, t in and each choice of s. And that gives you the equivalent eigenvalues. So two, minus 2, minus 5, minus 8, and 10 refer to the continuous time system choice of eigenvalues. And we want the closed loop eigenvalues in these cases, which are positive real but less than 1. So they're on, you know, they're real, positive real eigenvalues. Now, what we're going to do now is to find the eigenstructures and then build up those long partition matrices. Now, first of all, what we're going to do is find this I'll take you to the slide, and then you'll see how these correlate to the, uh, to the actual solution. OK, this is the slide I want. First of all, uh, I'm going to build up this matrix here. Lambda i minus a is the first partition, and b is the second partition. And then I'm going to find the eigenstructures okay, of that. So this is what's going on in this next bit of the tutorial. Lambda i minus a, right, lambda i minus a, it's b now because it's a discrete time system, b, that's the matrix on the left of that part, and I'm looking for uh, the eigenvectors which correspond to it. Well, those eigenvectors belong to the null space of that matrix, so I'm using the null command to get them, and there's four of them, right? Uh, so let's build these up, and when we do this, what you'll find is that each of these has two columns. Right? I have two columns. So this is an eigenstructure, that's an eigenstructure, and so on. And there's as many columns as you have inputs, and it's a two-input system. And now what we're going to do is combine all of those into a big partition called U. So back to the, script, back to the presentation again. What we're, the stage we're at now is we've found all of these, right? and we're putting them all into the big U matrix down here. Okay. That's the next step of this tutorial. And so we're not changing any of these matrices. All we're doing is packing them into a giant matrix now, which has eight columns in it because there are four states and uh, there are four states and two inputs, right? So there's the first eigenstructure matrix, the second, the third, and then the fourth is down there. So now we've got the new matrix. And now what we're going to do is exploit the structural relationship between the columns of these matrices. So the next step on this is to do all this. All right? You're going to exploit the structural relationship. You know that matrix because that's the upper set of partitions. You know that matrix because that's the lower set of partitions in you. Now we have to select columns. I'll show you how to do that. Now, I'm going to firstly separate out the upper four rows and the lower two rows because the upper four rows are the CI matrices and the lower rows are the K-type CI matrices. So that's going to be columns of S and G that we're going to select. Uh, and then what we're going to do is select the corresponding columns for these. But before we can do it, we have to find the most orthogonal columns among this. And it ain't easy to do that. First of all, what I'm going to do, I'll show you what I'm going to do here. We've got eight columns, right? And those are arranged in four pairs each pair coming from a different eigenvalue. And from each pair, we've got to select one column. Right? So one column from the first pair, one column from the second, and so on. But each time I select a column, I've got to try and make sure that it's as orthogonal as possible with respect to all the others. And it's not easy, because if I select a column from the first one and a column from the second pair, they're orthogonal. And I select a, third, a column from the third pair, I've got to make sure it's orthogonal to the other two as well. See? So it's not just that it's orthogonal to one of the other. Yeah, and you've got, to, you've got to work it all out. So what we're going to do is firstly normalize all the, cho all the choices. So I've given these columns numbers, right? V11, V12, V21, V22. Each pair 
is it represents a column. And I'm going to normalize these vectors. Now, that's all that's going on here. There you go. So I've normalized all the things. So these are the vectors that are all normalized. And now what I'm going to do, see, there might be a mathematical way of doing this optimally, but I don't know what it is. And I've just gone through this with a sledgehammer and tried all the possible combinations, uh, choosing, you know, in this case, V11, V21 means for the choice, first column in the first pair and the first column in the second pair, what's the dot product of those two? Add it to the dot product of V21, V31, add it to the dot product of V31, V41, you get a number, right? That means for that choice, I've got a number. And the smaller that number is, the more orthogonal is that particular selection of four vectors. So I've done this for all the possible permutations of here. And at the bottom, I'm picking out the most orthogonal one based on the smallest dot, mod dot product sum. Index 10, and that's the dot product sum. So the biggest value that the dot product can be for any pair is 1. If you have two vectors that are normalized that lie on top of one another, you get 1. And the smallest value is 0 if they're orthogonal to one another. Right? So 1 is the smallest choice of four dot products going through. So they might all be 0.24. They might be a really big one, and the rest are really small, whatever it is. But it's the tenth one, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, I suppose I could have read that there, couldn't I? That's 10. And it was the second column of the first pair, the first column of the second pair, the first column of the third pair, and whatever that was. I just got to read it off. It's 2, 3, 5, and 8 that I chose. So I selected that pair, and I'm selecting those columns from each of those matrices to form the G and the F matrices. That's what's going on there. So there's the F and the G matrices now in MATLAB. And now all I have to do, because G is 4 by 4, and its columns are as orthogonal as they can be. Hopefully, that's nicely invertible. I'm not going to run into any numerical issues. And uh, I can invert that, post multiply f by it, and find k. So let's do that as the last step. And there is the k matrix that we hope is going to produce satisfactory flight dynamics. Lateral matrix. It's got two rows because it's a two input system, and it's got four columns because it's a fourth order system. So now, let's, before I actually go ahead and use it, we'll just verify that this choice of gains does indeed result in the correct eigenvalues. System matrix, remember, is phi minus gamma k. And so what we'll do is we'll work out the, uh, the eigenvalues. So here, I'm just repeating the eigenvalues that uh, I've already chosen. There's nothing unique about them. We don't know what they are. And here's the eigenvalues of the closed loop system. So let's run it, and we should be encouraged to find that although they might be in a different order, the desired eigenvalues do appear in the list of actual eigenvalues for that choice of k, which is great. Now, that choice of k is not the only feedback gain matrix that would have given us the right answers. There are others, but it is the choice of gains that will give us the best performance when we come to look at the dynamic performance. So let's, the reason being that the eigenvectors are most orthogonal, the closed loop eigenvectors are most orthogonal. Because the eigenvalues will tell you about transient response for no, no zeros. They, they'll tell you about stability. But they, it's the eigenvectors that contribute the shape of the response. So the eigenvectors of the closed loop will be different for that different choice of k. At this point, all these values are the computational exercise based on the input matrix. The input matrix and the system matrix. Yeah. Well, I ended up at the best possible scenario. So first of all, it doesn't just depend on B. It depends on A and B, on gamma and phi. Uh, and the reason that we ended up with the best possible arrangement is that we've chosen the most orthogonal set of eigenstructures because we check the orthogonality of each selection. Yes, yes, that's, that's the key step. It, to be honest, it looks complicated, but it's just following a set of steps. That's all it is. It's a process. It's not, it's not really very difficult. It's just that it's the first time you've seen it, it looks difficult because it looks like there's a lot in there. So what I'm going to do now is to go ahead and check this. 
by actually running a simulation. Um, I'm going to compare the compensated and uncompensated responses. Um, and remember, it's an airplane. It's a complicated thing. So I haven't got a, an input yet. All I'm doing is computing the initial condition response for, for, for this. And uh, I'm going to plot roll rate as an output versus time. I'm going to do this for the compensated and uncompensated responses. So I just run this script and, the, and, and work out the result. Now, you can guess which one the uncompensated one is, right? This is the uncompensated one. Now, you, it's initial condition. You can't look at steady state and draw any conclusions from it. Uh, but you can look at the transient response and see that this is not terribly good. But this one has what you would expect from an eigenvalue selection consisting of four real eigenvalues. Okay. It's a nice, fast response, and it's a certainly better transient response than that one is. Uh, second uh, tutorial here. Now, this is, um, I think, a little bit more telling, because what I've done here is go through exactly the same process as I've just shown you before. So I'm not going to repeat the, the detail. We created the model. We discretized it. We selected some eigenvalues and discretized them. And then we went through this lengthy process to determine what the eigenvalues were, including making this orthogonal selection. Remember, I did the sledgehammer approach of finding the most orthogonal selection through. And I chose the minimum value before. Now I'm going to show you what happens when you choose the least orthogonal set. Well, I'm not. I'm going to show you the least orthogonal but one. And the reason is that if I choose the least orthogonal set, it can't invert them anymore. It's numerically not stable enough to do the inversion. I have to choose. I have to back it off one, so I choose uh, the slightly less, uh, or slightly less or from, uh, more orthogonal one. What I would like to have done is chosen select columns one, three, five, and seven, but that can't be inverted, so I've had to choose one, four, six, and eight. Right, and so I've got here the best case gain, and here the worst case gain. And remember, they're going to give us the same eigenvalues but the performance is still going to be different. So let's just run it and see what pops out the bottom of this thing. It's still, still stable because the eigenvalues are still where they should be. But the blue one is the response, the initial condition response for the best possible eigenvalues, uh, best possible eigenstructure selection, and the green one for the worst possible eigenstructure assignment. Level. So this is motivation for making sure that your eigenstructure selection is as orthogonal as it can be. I'm going to come back to this in just a second because um, I've chosen uh, conveniently a case where uh, all of the eigenvalues that I aimed for were real. And if they're not real, if you happen for some reason to want a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues, you've got to be a little bit careful when you make your selection because you can end up with complex values uh, which propagate through into K and you can't implement those gains. And so what you have to do is, if you want complex conjugate eigenvalues, what you do is you have to make sure that the real and the imaginary part is are represented in the choice. So when you come to select the columns, you select the real part from one and the imaginary part from the same column in the next partition here. So you, you can select uh, first part, first uh, column here, it's got to be the first column here. So you, your choice is not quite as flexible as it was before because you've got to operate in complex conjugate pairs. And I just want to quickly sh demonstrate that to you in the form of the uh, Flight Crusader project. So uh, this is the same as before. The only difference is that now I'm selecting a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues at minus 3 plus and minus uh, J3. So let's just quickly run through it, and you'll see, see what I mean. So there are the uh, eigenvalues that I'm aiming for. And all we're simply going to do is go, th go through this again. But I, I have to choose the real part and the imaginary part from, complex, from corresponding columns across F and G when I do this. Uh, so uh, just let me do that. There you go. So now the G matrix is completely real. So I'm just taking the real and imaginary part. It'll invert. And when I check the eigenvalues, they are um, uh, they are where they need to be. They're not where they need to be, are they? Yeah, I had an 
minus 3 plus or minus j3, and it hasn't quite turned out, has it? 4.5. Look at that. I think, no, I think these are the digital names. Okay. Uh, something's gone wrong uh, with this. I apologize for that. Um, I'll figure it out and uh, I'll send you the tutorials or you can email me the tutorials. I'm really sorry about that. I don't quite know what's gone wrong. No, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's, well, it's, the order will be different, but still the eigenvalues are not where they're supposed to be. It should be minus three plus, or three plus a minus. Wait a minute, Vishal, you're right. You're right. I'm so sorry. You're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Well, my thinking, yeah. So uh, the original eigenvalues were in the estimate. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the desired eigenvalues once you've converted them into discrete domain. I'm sorry, I don't know quite why I missed that. And these are the actual eigenvalues, which are the same. It's just that the order is different. Phew. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same as you might choose, you know, when you do the root locus method, a complex conjugate pair, you might want a faster rise time, and you might be prepared to put up with a little bit of oscillation in order to achieve it, providing that the overshoot or undershoot isn't too bad. Um, what I'll do is I'll just quickly run through the same, same thing that we did before when I choose these. Um, so in this case, because the complex conjugate eigenvalues are there, you've got this little bit of undershoot now. And if we compare that from what we had before, it might be that the, the, the convergence is faster, but uh, there, there is this oscillation or a little bit of undershoot that we might find tolerable. So that's, that's, that's the basic reason, is to give it a faster, faster response as you can. Uh, you might, why would you do it for other reasons? I don't know. It's a good point. Okay, uh, let's go back to the tutorial then. Uh, sorry, to the, the presentation. Um, so having designed the feedback matrix now, we have methods which will account for either the single input case or the multiple input case. And the next thing to do is to turn our attention to the, the design of the input matrix N, which is how we can introduce a reference input to the system and also can force the steady state properties of the system. And uh, I'd like to remind you before we go on, although I think it's in, this, in the script, that the steady state is different between a continuous time system and a discrete time system. In the continuous time case, x dot equals zero in steady state, and in the discrete time case, x k plus one equals x of k. That'll come back very shortly uh, into what follows. Now, the way that this is designed, see, this on the left is the diagram of the actual controller that we're going to implement. We've designed the feedback matrix and the control law is NV minus K times X. So we need now to define N. But in designing N, it's more convenient if we can separate out the N into two partitions like this. Now, satisfy yourself that this is equivalent to this. The diagram on the right is equivalent to the diagram on the left because U equals NU times V plus nx times v minus, uh, minus, plus k times nx times v minus x, right, it's that. Now there are two terms involving v, so you have nu plus knx times v minus kx. Comparing it with what you would just write down, they're the same except that n has been replaced by nu plus k times n, and we already know k. So all we're doing is slightly redrawing things. These two diagrams are equivalent but it's going to turn out to be a lot easier. Well, the methods involve rewriting the input matrix in this form and then doing the design. And what we're trying to do is to select these two partitions such that the NX partition here in steady state forces what this here to be the same as the steady state of the state vector, okay? So when you subtract one from the other, you've got zero coming through the feedback gain matrix. So that zero, that's the job of NX. And then NU, what that does is that forces whatever control input you need here to guarantee that YSS is the same as VSS in steady state. Now, you can write that down in equation form. Here it is. For a continuous time system, 
you're going to have zero on the left because x dot equals zero in steady state. I'll come back to the discrete time case in just a moment. So you have zero equals a times xss plus b times uss, and yss equals cxss plus us uh, d times ussss. And you know that because of what I just told you about these two partitions of the well, these, these two matrices, NU and NX, you want NX chosen uh, to make, to be the same as XSS here. So NX times XSS equals XSS. In that case, this is XSS, that's XSS, and you've got zero going through K. All right, so that's what you need for NX. And NV, well, you choose NV such that U makes Y equal to V. So you've got NU times V equals USS. The other two things you need to know, well, one of them I've told you, the steady state requirement on the state vector, is that you want YSS to be equal to VSS in steady state. The whole point in doing this is you want the input and the output to be the same once all the transients have died away. So now what we can do is to insert these four things, well, three things anyway, into the, state, the system equation pair. We're going to replace XSS by that, USS by that, and YSS by that, and what you'll see is that everything now is expressed in terms of VSS, the input. For that. So this is what we've got, and quite happily, VSS will now cancel from everywhere, and we're just left with this in equation form. This is I times, so we've got zero and I once you cancel this out. A, B, C, D, because you've got A and X plus B and U, A and X plus B and U, and then C and X plus D and U, C and X plus D and U. So this is what we've got in equation form. See what the logic is? You've chosen N, X, and N, U to do those things that I told you in the previous slide. And then by just substituting, so everything's in terms of VSS, you end up with that equation pair, and I've written it in matrix form here. Now, we're within a whisker of having the answer, because I want to know what N, X, and N, U are. And if I did know that, I'd immediately be able to work because I know what their relationship is with N. And I've already got K. So as long as I know what NX and NU are, I'm almost there. And how do I get it? Well, I need to invert this matrix and pre-multiply both sides by it. The ABCD matrix here, inverted, will give me NX and NU. I know what the dimensions of them are, so I can just extract the partitions and use them directly in that formula for N. And that's really all there is to it. It's pretty simple because you know what A, B, C, and D are. You know their dimensions, so you know 0 and 1, 0 and I. And then you just plug the results for NX and NU into the formula to give you N. And that's, that's how you do it. Now, discrete time is a little bit different, but only because you can't get rid of the left-hand side of the state equation in steady state. It's XSS of K plus 1 equals XSS of K. So what you end up with is XSS on the left over here, times nx, uh, and then you can bring that over onto the right to make this zero. So everything's in, in, in place of, um, everything's in terms of VSS, which cancels in just the same way. Exactly the same logic, the only difference is because of this identity matrix, you have an identity matrix here. And that's the only difference. So that's one of the few differences uh, that there are between continuous time and discrete time uh, design. That is an excellent question, and I'm afraid I don't know the answer. I've never come across a case where it isn't, but, but maybe there is a test for it to be invertible or not. Or maybe there are conditions under which invertibility is guaranteed, but I'm afraid I don't know what they are. Yeah, good point. Sorry about that. Okay, let's, let's actually see it in action uh, in a tutorial, uh, which is 7.5. We're going back to the double mass control system, and all we're going to do is having designed the feedback gain matrix uh, to design a feed-forward matrix to achieve zero steady state error. So uh, it doesn't sound all that difficult, does it? But it is. Uh... All right, here we go again. And it looks like we're going to construct uh, a model of the system for the gain matrix that we've already arrived at and then test it under the same initial conditions uh, that we've been doing uh, up till now, which is a slight compression. And uh, 
what we're doing here is um, checking the step response of the system with n equals 1. So what we're, what we're doing here is forming the closed loop equations, but I'm just assuming that we haven't bothered to design in uh, the steady state matrix. So I'm just putting 1 in there. And of course, the steady state of this is going to be a little bit wrong. Uh, so this is the uncompensated step response. I'm just producing the step output, which is going to give us the position of y2 following the step of y1. This is, this is what you get. So it's under feedback control, but it's not uh, compensated. As the steady state is wrong. And uh, what you can see is that it's got the right eigenvalues because we designed them. Nicely, you know, nice smooth response in 20 seconds. It settles in 20 seconds, but the steady state is wrong. So what we'll do now is to compute that matrix that I told you about, which is phi minus i in the upper right partition, gamma, c, and d. That matrix is this matrix here, bottom of the slide. Uh, so let's form that matrix. There it is. And uh, now what we'll do is we'll uh, use that. Uh, so I bar is going to be the, this is the zero I matrix that we're going to have. We're going to invert M and multiply, and multiply it by that. So that will give us the matrix with the NX and NU partitions in it. There it is. So there's N bar. And we look more conveniently zeros and ones right now. And then what we'll do is simply extract the partitions because we know that the first four rows of this are going to comprise uh, NX. And the bottom one is going to comprise NU just from the partitions. And we plug them directly into uh, the formula to find out what N is. And N turns out to be 11.75. So let's now build the closed loop system and check its DC gain, which is 1. DC gain, by the way, uh, tells you what the gain of the system is. Um, so it's a nice handy formula to use. use it for transfer functions as well. So this one will tell me that its, that, uh, it's a state space description has a gain of 1. And when we plot the, trans the, the uh, step response of it, the steady state error has gone away, and it's got the same dynamic property. Okay. So that is how you do that is how you do input matrix design. Now, what you'll notice um, in both the discrete time and the continuous time case is that we need this matrix involving phi, gamma, t, and d, or a, b, c, and d. In other words, we need to know in advance what those matrices are exactly in order to compute n. And how often do you know that information? The answer is never. Um, you have obviously going to have some error in these matrices. And even if you don't, then who's to say over temperature or time that the matrices aren't going to change? So there is a robustness issue uh, when it comes to steady state. Um, and also, you know that you can solve those issues by fitting integral control around the system to remove automatically for you steady state error, just the same as it is for a transfer function, the transfer function approach. Now, there is a, a requirement here, of course, which is that until now, we've been very arbitrary about the number of inputs and number of outputs on the system. And we can no longer afford to be arbitrary, because if I'm going to apply integral control, there better be correlation between the inputs and the outputs. Otherwise, there's no point in checking the steady state error this way. So we not only require that we have the same number of inputs as we have outputs, R of t is the same as y of t, but we demand here correlation between them. The first input must affect the first output, and so on. There are technical reasons, too, why u of t must have the same dimensions as R of t, but I'm not going to go into that just at the moment. Now, if we have this happy situation, integral control works by adding an integrator before n. And uh, the input to the integrator is the error between the output y and the input r of t, which is a continuous time case. And so in this case, there will be m. You know, I think that should be p. Oh, no, it'd be m because there are m outputs, and therefore, by definition, p will be the same as m. So there are n integrators in here. Now, if I had a, steady, a, step, if I had a state space model of this system before, which was order n, I've now increased the order of the overall system by n. So the overall system has n plus n states in it. I've increased the system and increased the size of the state vector. 
and design has to take that into account. Here's how you do it. This is the just the controller part of this. Now there's feedback from the state vector as well as the feedback from the output, and the output is being compared with the reference and going through the integrator. So these are the equations. The controller we had before, which was for u, and u involved v, but v now has to satisfy this first order differential equation where r minus y, and y is cx plus theta uh, minus Oh, sorry, r minus y, so it's r minus cx minus c times u, okay? So now you've got that differential equation, and here's how you use it. Write these things down. We've inserted the equation for u, the control law, into the state equation, and into the output equation, uh, and into the output equation, that's the bottom one. And now here's the equation for v dot. So in the previous diagram, I had v dot equals r minus cx minus du, and that's u. So we plug u into there. What do you get? r minus cx minus dnv minus dk times, sorry, plus dkx. Yeah, plus dkx, which is that. Okay. Plus dkx minus cx minus dn times v plus r. Okay. Now, here's what you do. You're stuck with an additional n state. So what you do is you augment the state vector, the process called vector augmentation, where you define a new state vector, which is just stacked. You stack x on top of v. So your new state vector looks like x dot, v dot on the left, and x, v over here. That's the new state vector. And you just write these three equations in matrix form like this. So here you have what looks like a new set of system equations for the system with uh, integral control applied. Now, this is fine for simulation, and we are going to use it for simulation, but it's not fine for design. For design, I need to write these equations in a slightly different form, which keeps u separate from all of this, because I need to design to the control law. And here's what you do. All you do is you keep them separate. System equation, the, uh, matrix, the, the integrating equation with u as a separate quantity, and that's u over there. And that's the animation that don't work down there. And uh, this is how you write it. So writing that equation pair out with u as a separate uh, entity uh, is this. So satisfy yourself. That's the same as that. And that's the same as that. And now what you've got is an equation pair in the form that you can apply any of the techniques we've just done, such as uh, eigenstructure assignment or pole placement, to determine what this k bar is. That's the thing that we're looking for, because k bar corresponds to a matrix which has these, these partitions, k and n, in it, okay? And then once you found out what that is, um, well, you, you just plug it into the new system equations, and uh, there you go. Design proceeds using the same techniques as before. Except this is your, your system equation. That's the output equation, and E is the input equation. E is 0, 1 times R. So let's, uh, oh, uh, one more thing. That's the continuous time case. The discrete time case is a little bit different again because this is the way that the integrator proceeds in the integration. And so uh, v of k plus 1 equals r of k minus y of k plus v of k because you're accumulating through there, right? Uh, everything else uh, looks pretty similar uh, except that, except that, because of the way that the uh, you end up with an identity matrix in that partition down there, in the lower right partition, that's the only difference, and it's because of the way the integrator works. So let's design an integrating controller now for the double mass system, which I think is the next tutorial down here, 7.6. We're going to um, apply the uh, integrating control. And then what I'm going to do is examine the effects of plant model error. So what I'm going to do is deliberately induce an error in the plant model and see if it changes the control at all. Uh, so first of all then, 7.6, we proceed in exactly the same way we have. Uh, now, to begin with, having constructed the model, I'm going to take the gain, feedback gain and the input matrices from the previous tutorial, and I know they're going to change right, under integral control but I'm going to use them because I want to compare the effects of integral control with those of non-integral control. So we've constructed the matrices. And then what we're going to do is to design the integrating controller. So phi bar 
gamma bar from the previous slide. Let's, let's take a look at where they come from. So what I'm designing now is, oh, it's difficult. It's this set of matrices here. So C0 minus C0, B and D. I'm constructing these matrices in MATLAB, which are these. C0 is minus C1. Gamma bar is gamma and D. So I'm constructing those matrices. And then uh, selecting some eigenvalues. Now, you've got to be careful because you need more eigenvalues than you did before. Because now you've introduced a more, an integrator, which has augmented the state vector. So if you needed four eigenvalues before for closed loop control, now you need five. Because it's a single output system, single input system, there's another eigenvalue to take account of. And I've added it here at point two. So it's closer to the origin, so it shouldn't influence the dynamics too much, but you've got to add another one. And here we're using the Ackermann's method, uh, using phi bar and gamma bar to find out what the new K matrix is going to be. There is the new K matrix. Now, this is the kind of situation you want to watch out for because if one element in the K matrix is eight, there's another one of nine and a half, but there are a couple up here close to 100, and there's one at 35. This is the kind of thing that might ring alarm bells because the um, the elements, the, the control effort might be large, right? So watch out for this kind of situation when it arises. Uh, and so now what we'll do is extract the new K and the N from the partitions of K bar. There they are. And we'll compute solution using integral control. So where we are now is we know what K and N are. What I'm now doing is simulating the model using these matrices here. Okay, so this is the closed loop with integral control state equations just here, having redesigned K and N to have integral control in them. That's what's going on here, so let's do that. And uh, now we need to just check that those give us the right eigenvalues. And it looks very much as if they do. Okay, so that's the desired eigenvalue set for the integrating controller, including one at point two, and we've ended up with the actual eigenvalues, eigen C bar minus gamma K is that. So it looks like everything's okay so far. And now what we're going to do is plot the step response with input matrix control only. So this is going to be no integral control, just with the uh, the, in, the N and the K matrix, right? This is before we did integral control, just for reference. There it is. So zero steady state error, that's fine, uh, because we've designed it that way by knowing what the matrices are. And now what we'll do is we'll overlay the results of the integrating controller. Now, in green, you have the integrating controller. In blue, you have the original one. And you notice that there's a separation between the two. Why? Why is there a difference between these two? The steady state's the same, so obviously we haven't in, in influenced that at all. Delay, why? Why? Not quite. Not quite. You would have the same difference. In no, that's not, that doesn't apply here. Uh, we're not doing vector selection. That applies if you've got a multiple input case. Uh, but here we're just using Ackerman's formula because it's single input. No, it's, that's not the reason. The reason is that there's another eigenvalue in there. We had to select another eigenvalue, and we put it close to the origin at point two. It doesn't influence it much, but it's that eigenvalue that's responsible for this. Um, it, it's not the delay through the, eigen, through the integrator, it's the eigenvalue. You would find the same separation if you use an integrated uh, continuous time controller. Now, that's how you do it, but then you might be looking at these curves thinking, why bother? Because they both give you the same zero steady state error. And uh, so I, I, I will answer my own rhetorical questions by, uh, by showing you why you, why you would want to do that. And what I've done here is um, I have reconstructed a new uh, system matrix. And the only difference between it and the previous one is that I've changed one of the elements by a rather small amount, 0.02. And so uh, when I uh, just put these with the, through the, the system with exactly the same uh, matrices, without redesigning K and N, you would expect a little bit of an error in there. Uh, but when I use exactly the same design of integrating controller, well, I hope to convince you that it's not going to be very different. 
So we'll reconstruct those matrices, and then what we'll do is um, just plow through this and just compare the two. So what we've got in the non-integrating controller case is a very different steady state error. And in the integrating controller case, because steady state error is taken out automatically for us by the very fact that we've got an integrator in there and it's a step input, the steady state performance has been preserved. And this is for a very small difference in input matrix. So for example, if I show you what C was, it was that, and if I show you what C error was, the only difference between these two matrices is in this fella here, the bottom left-hand corner has gone from 0.1783 to 0.1983. All the other elements are exactly the same. It's a very small change that I've made, and yet uh, the difference to steady state performance is quite profound. So integral control has you know, the advantage of taking that out of the, uh, of, of the, of the situation. All right, uh, we're almost there for part seven, which is great, because it's half past two, and that's where I like to break for a coffee anyway. Uh, let's do a quick quiz. Why is state feedback control preferable to output feedback control? Yeah, you, that's right. So you have complete freedom to place the poles anywhere you like in the complex plane. And the reason for that is that the state vector contains all the information about the internal dynamics of the system which the output vector doesn't necessarily carry. What's the risk of having large elements in the state feedback gain matrix? Yeah. Right. Right. Those sorts of considerations on the control effort, because the control uh, vector u is n v minus k times x. Anyway, it's minus k times x, so the state, state vector is being multiplied by all these elements, and if they're large, you can expect large values in U. That could run the risk of saturating, saturating actuators, but it does also, it could also amplify noise and amplify other disturbances. So you've got to be careful for that type of thing. And you end up with large elements when you move the open loop poles a long way to the closed loop poles. That's what gives you large elements in K. How does state feedback affect stability? Well. I suppose the answer to this is a little bit open-ended, isn't it? Because it might or might not affect it. Could it affect it? Yes. It could, couldn't it? <laughs> you can make the system unstable if you want to. I guess I should write that, rewrite question three, really. Uh, yes, it affects it. Um, and uh, I suppose the answer I was probably looking for is that the open loop system has stability, which is defined by the eigenvalues of lambda i minus a, whereas <laughs> feedback control is lambda on minus A plus B plus B K. That's how it